the bench players on that team were called the Gumbies. Yeah. And what I remember about this lady's van, family friend of ours named Arlene, and we would get in Arlene's van. She just had Gumbies, Gumby figures, like everywhere on the dashboard, <laughs> you know, hanging from the rear view mirror. Yeah. The interior of that van was a perfect symbol for the entire city that year. It was all anybody could think about in Tucson. It's one of those time and place things. If you didn't grow up in Tucson, Arizona, you don't know how that team just set that town on fire, so to speak, with uh, basketball fever that year. What Brad and I are trying to do with the film is give anyone who didn't grow up in Tucson, Arizona, the same feeling that we had, the same sense that we had as kids, that that was a really, really special time and a special team. And you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first time thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 92. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm happy to welcome brothers Brad and Sean Malone to the show. They are co-directors and producers of a forthcoming documentary, Wild About 88, The Rise of Arizona Basketball. We discuss their respective love for the University of Arizona and the film's creation process. The guys have interviewed Arizona legends, including Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr, Judd Bushler, Tom Tolbert, Coach Lute Olson, and other luminaries from the college basketball ranks. To learn more about the documentary and possibly support its production financially or through connections, visit wildabout88.com. Brad's Arizona-based podcast is also accessible on the site, or simply search for Bear Down Bias, three words, on your podcast player of choice. Select episodes of his show include audio clips from conversations that will appear in the film. One constant with Brad and Sean is the dedication and positivity that they convey, and I'm sure you'll hear it too in our conversation. Show notes for this episode, including links to numerous topics covered, will be available at inallairness.com slash 92. Now, on to the show. My guests today are Brad and Sean Malone, brothers, co-directors and producers of a documentary project titled Wild About 88, The Rise of Arizona Basketball. It focuses on the University of Arizona's 1988 Final Four team, a roster that included five future NBA players, Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr, Judd Bushler, Tom Tolbert and Anthony Cook. Brad and Sean are graduates of the University of Arizona. Welcome to you both, and thanks for joining me. Thank you, Adam. And there is actually one more NBA player on that team, but he was redshirting. It was Sean Rooks. Oh, of course. I looked at his stats before we got going. 89 would have been his first season. Would that be right? Because he was redshirted. Yeah. Yeah, you were right. There were five that played, but we always say six just so it sounds better. (laughs) It sounds great with five. It sounds even better with six. Right. Sadly, um, Sean Rooks uh, passed away in 2016, I think. Terrible, of course. That was really sad. We were actually in contact with him around that time. Oh, really? When he passed away, yeah. yeah. He agreed to do an interview or to at least talk about doing an interview for the movie. Then we learned, you know, quickly after that that he had he had passed away. So, yeah, very sad. He was a great Wildcat. Yeah, that is sad news. Uh, and also another former Wildcat. Brian Williams, who would be later known as Bison Daylay, uh, sadly as well passed away or was declared dead after being missing for X amount of time uh, in 2002. So sad news too. Two great players. Absolutely. So just for some context for this conversation, according to sportsreference.com, since 1985, the Arizona Wildcats have only missed the NCAA tournament twice. I think that was 2010, 2012. Now correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, the program has produced many great players in that time, uh, including, as we mentioned uh, just a moment ago, uh, Sean Rooks, uh, Bison Daly, and guys like Chris Mills, Damon Stoudemire, uh, Andre Iguodala, Richard Jefferson, Jason Terry, and Mike Bibby, to name just some. Um, and then also the Wildcats won the national championship in 1997. 
let's hop into the DeLorean for a moment and key in 1988. Brad, you were 13 years old, and I think, Sean, you were seven. What's the origin story of your respective love for the Wildcats? Well, we both grew up in Tucson, Arizona. It's kind of a college town. It's, it's big now. It's over a million people. When we were growing up, it wasn't really known much for except older folks would go there to retire. Mexican food is really good. And there was this place called Old Tucson, which was a movie, like a movie studio, which in the 50s and 60s shot a lot of Westerns out there. And John Wayne actually shot four Westerns out there, I think. All right. Okay. So that was what Tucson was kind of known for. And when Lute Olson came to town in around 1983, he told everyone, get your tickets now. You know, you want to get your tickets because, you know, we're going to turn this thing around. And, and he did. And that uh, 88 team, I think that was Lute Olson's fifth year in Tucson, but it was when I really kind of got obsessed with the Wildcats because it was just the thing to talk about when you were at school. And being a big sports fan as I was, and it was actually funny, a friend of mine, he, he was in a little league the year after, this was a baseball little league, the year after the Wildcats went to the Final Four, and he told me that there were 10 teams and nine of them named their team the Wildcats. <laughs> that says a fair bit about the influence there, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so it was just like everywhere. It, they were just like rock stars because Tucson had never seen anything like this. The winning, they just they would destroy teams. They... And they were playing great programs, uh, you know, early on. They weren't, they were in the top 25, but they, they beat Syracuse. Syracuse had gone to the national title game the year before. Um, they beat Michigan when Michigan had Glenn Rice. They beat Duke at McHale Center, Coach K. Um, they're all these blue blood programs. They were, you know, beating these teams and most of the time beating them soundly. And the winning just took over. Uh, Tucson loved it. So that was Brad speaking, just so our listener knows who's who. And now, Sean, how about yourself? Yeah, just to echo on what Brad said, I was a kid. I was younger than Brad at the time. We're six years different in our ages. I just remember the entire town being obsessed with Arizona basketball. We had a a friend of ours who used to give us a, a ride to school every day, kind of like a carpool thing. And this lady worked at the airport where she would wait for the players to come and she would get pictures with them and she would get autographs and then she would, you know, give little things to us. And something we can get into a little later if you want, the bench players on that team were called the Gumbies. Yeah. And what I remember about this lady's van, family friend of ours named Arlene, and we would get in Arlene's van. She just had Gumbies, Gumby figures like everywhere on the <laughs> dashboard, you know, hanging from the rear view mirror. Yeah. The interior of that van was a perfect symbol for the entire city that year because it was all anybody could think about in Tucson. It's one of those time and place things. If you didn't grow up in Tucson, Arizona, you don't know how that team just, you know, set that town on fire, so to speak, with uh, basketball fever that year. And of course, what Brad and I are trying to do with the film is give anyone who didn't grow up in Tucson, Arizona, the same feeling that we had, the same sense that we had as kids, that that was a really, really special time and a special team. I'm going to ask you shortly about the Gumbies. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, what I did want to ask, how did Arizona Wildcats basketball compare to the Phoenix Suns of the NBA? Obviously, the Phoenix Suns franchise is still held in high regard and it was just building itself into a, a contender in the late 80s and then into the early 90s, obviously, in the NBA. Uh, how did that sort of work in terms of support and uh, a following from the fans? So the Suns in Tucson, I would say they weren't a big Big deal at that time in 88. Um, you know, that was during the time the Lakers and the Celtics were always meeting each other in the finals. And I remember uh, even seeing a, a story about how I think Steve Curry had gotten drafted by the Suns originally. And he was at some shoot around for some basketball camp. And all the players there were kind of disappointed that he got drafted by the Suns. And they were, cause you know, they were all Lakers fans or they were Boston fans. <laughs> but I mean, the Suns, they, they definitely had their time, you know, in the early nineties when Charles Barkley came, it became more popularized. But I would say it's still the Wildcats totally dominate the interest because Tucson is, is a hundred miles from Phoenix. The Wildcat basketball program is kind of its pro sports team. Um, even though it's college, you know, Phoenix has the NBA, the NFL, uh, NHL, Major League Baseball, they have it all. 
I'd say the Cardinals, Arizona Cardinals or the Diamondbacks. There's there's quite a few fans, but the town still is full of fans of other teams because it's kind of a transplant city. You know, people come to retire here. The Wildcats definitely are are bigger than the Suns, I would say. <laughs> Did you guys attend games in Tucson for the Wildcats and travel to watch them play away from home? Actually, we have a funny story about this uh, that has to do with Shaquille O'Neal. But <laughs> before I, Sean tells that, yeah, like as a kid, our dad would take us every once in a while to the games. He'd get tickets. Um, and then when I got into college, I got season tickets. And then after college, I would get single game tickets. And then now I've had season tickets for about 10 years now. Sometimes I'll go on the road. Out to LA, they'll play UCLA. I'll come out to a game here. They'll play up at Tempe and ASU. But there was one time when we were kids, uh, the first year Shaquille O'Neal was in college basketball, he kind of, his coming out party was against Arizona. He destroyed us in Baton Rouge. And he was coming back to Tucson the next year. They were playing a home and home. And my dad got tickets for the game. And Sean, what happened? <laughs> Well, my dad said, who wants to go? And I said, I do. So my dad took me to the Shaquille O'Neal game and Brad pouted about that. I think he's still pouting <laughs> I about am it. still pouting. <laughs> that he didn't get to go see Shaq. And, and what happened at the game was Sean Rooks had an incredible game and pretty much stopped Shaquille O'Neal from taking over the game and the Wildcats won. And so it was kind of one of those great games at McHale Center where the Wildcats vanquished Shaquille O'Neal and LSU. And yeah, poor Brad didn't get to see it. <laughs> You're not bitter to this day, of course, are you, Brad? No, no. I guess <laughs> I had just gotten a job too. So it was like, it was like my first job. So it would have been pretty bad if I would have, you know, but I guess it doesn't matter now, but whatever. I'm glad he had to enjoy that. <laughs> That's funny stuff. Um, now you mentioned the Gumbies. We talked about some of the key players on the 88 team. However, the lesser known guys were also important figures that were on the squad, affectionately known as the Gumbies. I didn't know this until just before we chatted today. What's the history of that name? And can either of you talk to the importance of some of those players that didn't get the on-court minutes as such, but were still vital in terms of the uh, the morale of the team? Yeah, sure. So there was a player on Arizona who actually became a student coach named Bruce Frazier. And when he was playing that role of, you know, being on the B team and playing against the starters in practice and not getting a lot of playing time, he would say to his teammates and to, the, to Coach Olson, I just feel like a Gumby out there. <laughs> Steve Kerr, he asked him one time, well, what do you mean? You feel like a Gumby. What does that mean? He goes, you know, I just feel like I'm stiff and like I'm bent around and, <laughs> and the Gumbies, you know, we don't get any respect. <laughs> so... When he became a student coach, that name that he had called himself kind of stuck with those quote unquote bench players. The bench players started calling themselves the Gumbies as like a point of pride, like we're the Gumbies, you know? <laughs> but the really special thing about the Gumbies, and it speaks to the special nature of that team, and Coach Olson talked about this when we interviewed him, was that the Gumbies were so supportive of their teammates and of the starters, and they were known across the country. There was articles about them in USA Today or a blurb in Sports Illustrated about the antics of the Gumbies. And basically they would do like choreographed dances and they had different cheers. And if Sean Elliott made a three, they had a dance for that. And if this Steve Kerr, you know, <laughs> Sean Elliott had a dunk, they had some yeah. sort of dance for that. They had a dance or a cheer pretty much for everything. And they just became in a, in a little way, I guess, America's sweetheart, but definitely Tucson's sweetheart in, in the sense that you know, Tucson just loved the Gumbies. And then at McHale Center, the fans would stick around, even if, I mean, the Cats would be beating teams by like 35 points with two minutes left, and there'd still be a packed house, and the fans would be, you know, chanting, bring in the Gumbies. You know, they wanted to see the Gumbies play. <laughs> and then the Gumbies, they would extend leads. Like, they were no slouches. I mean, they had a Sean Rooks was a Gumby. Judd Bushler was a Gumby. Matt Muehlbach, who ended up being, he had a triple-double in the Pac-10. He was a all-Pac-10 conference player. I mean, these were great players, and they were just had to wait their time. So they'd go in, and they want to expand the leads. And the cool thing about Bruce Frazier is now he's actually an assistant with the Golden State Warriors. Oh, right. He is like Steve Kerr's best friend. You may see him sometimes uh working out Steph Curry. If you watch videos of Steph Curry working out and stuff, a lot of those regiments 
uh, Bruce Frazier, I think, came up with those. Okay. Another funny thing about Bruce Frazier is his nickname is Q because he always asks questions. So to this day, Steve Kerr, all those guys, they just call him Q. They don't call him Bruce. They call him Q. <laughs> there was one game when he actually had a little miniature Gumby and he put it in his sock <laughs> and he took it out on the court. He was playing and he got hammered. It got fouled. The Gumby fell out <laughs> and the ref picked it up. He says, what's this? And Bruce said, that's mine. That's mine, ref. Just, you know, can I have that back, please? <laughs> and then Steve Kerr told us a story about when he was with the Cavs that he was um, good buddies with Craig Elo and Paul McKeskey. So Craig Elo especially gravitated towards this idea. And, and Craig Elo even put a Gumby in his sock. And <laughs> according to Steve Kerr at the forum, the same thing happened. He went up for a you know a dunk or a layup or whatever and got fouled and the Gumby fell out. <laughs> at the Great Western Forum. So just a few little tidbits that uh, we've got to learn from doing this film. That's fantastic. I love it. Thank you for sharing these. Um, at what point did you both go from being super fans of Arizona to then deciding, well, why don't we get together and produce a documentary about the 88 Wildcats? Well, uh, it, kind of a two-parter here because there was my end where I guess it was about 2000 – Eight. So now we're over 10 years now <laughs> working on this film. But I, I went to a, a screening of this uh, film. A friend of mine had made a documentary. It was about this ostrich farm that was between Tucson and Phoenix. And I was really taken by this documentary. I, was, I thought it was very compelling, fascinating, a great narrative, great story. And I was like, this is really cool. You know, maybe I could make a movie. It kind of inspired me because I'd always love movies. Sean and I grew up loving movies still to this day. I thought, well, what do I know the most about? And I thought, well, the 88 team. I mean, that was my first love as a sports fan. At that moment, I was like, I think I could make a movie about that. I had no idea how hard or difficult it was going to be. I just thought, yeah, I'm going to make a movie about this. And I just started researching and it was fun. It was kind of like reliving my youth. And then um, Sean. Yeah, may I jump in? So then I was in film school at that time. I went to film school at the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida. And Brad and I would talk on the phone. And one time he called me and he told me about this idea he had for a movie about the 88 team. And, you know, as, an, as a filmmaker or at that time, an aspiring filmmaker, the moment someone finds out you're a filmmaker or aspire to be a filmmaker, they want to tell you their idea for a movie. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, you're a filmmaker. Oh, I got a great idea. You should make this, you know. <laughs> um, so Brad was telling me about his idea. Uh, but unlike so many of this, those scenarios, I heard his idea and I thought, that's a great idea. I knew the power of that story and the power of that team and really how that team had changed the identity of Tucson, given Tucson a point of pride to hang its hat on. I, I just knew how that team had transformed the town. And that's as powerful a story as any, you know, a, a rags to riches story about a program that inspired a city. I saw the, the power in it and immediately thought, well, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, I lived in Florida at the time and felt like I couldn't really help Brad too much with it. But a few years later, I ended up moving to California. And once I got here and we realized most of the players live in California or some are still in Arizona. And once we realized that pretty much, I'd say 80% of our target interviews were West Coast, especially California and Arizona, then it was like, oh, well, I live in California now. Now I can help you with this movie. And on a handshake, so to speak, Brad and I became co-directors of the movie. Great background. I came across a fantastic video on YouTube whilst researching for the chat today. Does the following phrase, which I won't be singing, mind you, uh, mean anything to either of you? W-I-L-D, cats. W-I-L-D, wild cats. <laughs> yes. Oh, I've set you up beautifully. We didn't ever actually arrange that. Thank you. There's a, a great rap video of sorts, which is performed by players on the team of that 88 Wildcats uh, squad. It's on YouTube and it's fantastic. And I, I hadn't seen it until just this morning, to be honest. Was that actually played regularly on TV back in the day or did it become more well known once the YouTube era came about? That's so indicative of what that team meant to Tucson. Harvey Mason Jr., who's now a Grammy Award winning record producer in L.A., he was on the team, and he and another gentleman wrote the song. Oh, one of the local pop stations. I think his guy's name was Mike Elliott, shock jock DJ of Tucson, 
So he and this local DJ wrote this song together and they made it about an anti-drug message. So uh, in the song, the players say, we don't do drugs because we're the best, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the rest of the song is just about the team, you know, like Elliot says, Elliot's here. It's time to play. <laughs> then he says, they want me in the NBA. Funny stuff. We'll spare you all the singing. But anyway, um, <laughs> they wrote this song and they put it out on the radio and it became the number one hit in Tucson. <laughs> and on the local news, they would show the video. I mean, they would show it every night. Brad and I, I have memories of sitting at our uh, little boom box that you had a cassette in it, cassette recorder, and just waiting for the song to come on and recording it so that we could <laughs> listen to it over and over and over. That's a perfect <laughs> example of how that team inspired the town. I remember when the video premiered, it was on the news the 10 o'clock news and I stayed up to watch it and recorded it. And then I just kept rewinding and watching it. And then the radio station who had produced it, they had this thing called like the top eight at eight. Yeah. You know, you're going up against Michael Jackson. Jackson, guns and roses, all, you know, all the pop heavyweights of the, of the late eighties and Arizona wildcat basketball team would be the number one song every night. It was amazing. That's fantastic. Did that actually come up at all in any of your conversations with people that you interviewed? Oh, yeah. We tried to get a couple of guys to sing their part. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel like I sort of tricked Sean Elliott into saying his line. <laughs> they want me in the NBA. Elliott here. It's time to play. They want me in the NBA. When Tober plays, he plays to win. I put it up and it goes in. Huh. Give Kerr the ball, give Kerr a hand. I'll drill it in from three point land. <laughs> ask the Gumbies, ask the refs. We don't do drugs because we're the best. W I L D. That's W I L D. Wildcats. They got a huge kick out of it, and most of them. Matt Muehlbach was one in particular who said, oh, my kids just won't stop giving me a hard time about this. Like, they'll never <laughs> let me live this down. And anytime I try to get them to do something, they're like, Dad, remember that video you made? <laughs> That's funny because I've watched it maybe two or three times this morning. And it actually grew on me. The more I listened to it, the more I liked it. So that uh, certainly had some good lyrics. It's not bad. I think Harvey Mason Jr., I think he's up to like seven or eight Grammy Awards at this point. So Wow. The guy's okay at writing songs, apparently. Can write, definitely. You've got a great trailer for Wild About 88. I'll include that in the show notes for what it's worth. From memory, there's Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr, uh, Coach Lute Olsen. I think Jay Billis is one of the guys interviewed as well. How was the process of getting people to commit to being a part of the documentary? So regarding how we got all these folks, we have a friend of our family who is fond of saying, if you don't A-S-K, you don't G-E-T. Nice. That's kind of how we got all these people. When people ask us, oh, how did you get this person? How did you get Steve Kerr? How did you get Sean Elliott? It's usually that we ask them, and it never quite plays out the same way. Um, Sean Elliott and Steve Kerr, I think Brad approached in person. Um, he found them at games that they were broadcasting because they were both in broadcasting at the time and just spoke to them personally and said, hey, would you do this? Um, Dick Vitale, we actually reached out to on social media. Coach Olson, we went up to at a game too. That was really instrumental. Those early interviews that we got into getting the dominoes to fall, so to speak. Because once Coach Olson says yes, and Steve Kerr says yes, and Sean Elliott says yes, then it was much easier to reach out to the rest of the guys and say, hey, you know, would you like to do an interview the same way Coach Olson or Steve Kerr or Sean Elliott did? And it kind of got easier as we went along to get people to agree to it. And another thing, like, Sometimes it would be, you know, we'd have to wait months and you just had to be patient. Like with Steve yeah. Kerr, I think it was over a year before we finally connected. He lived in California at the time and uh, this was before he was with the Warriors. It was like right after the Suns when he wasn't the general manager anymore. So so I just approached him at a game and he was announcing at the time and I told him and we just kind of exchanged emails and finally... I think it was we, like a year later. Yeah, it was like a year later. And, and then the Sean Elliott one was... Complete opposite. It was funny. Uh, there was a game up in Tempe, Arizona State, against Arizona. And Sean Elliott was announcing the game. And I was at the game, and I didn't know he was there. Sean was watching the game on TV, and he saw that Sean Elliott was at the game. 
Well, Arizona, unfortunately, lost that game. I was outside the arena. I'd already walked out, and Sean Malone, not Sean Elliott, had said, you know, Sean Elliott is in the arena. You have to go back and talk to him. And, you know, we had just <laughs> lost. I didn't want to go back in there. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of Wildcat fans there, but it's mostly Arizona State fans. And But I did it, and I walked all the way down. I talked to Sean Elliott, and I think it was two or three weeks later, we were interviewing him in Phoenix as he was on a road trip because he does a lot of announcing for the Spurs. Mm -hmm, yeah. That's how we get a lot of these guys. When we made the trailer, we knew we needed Lute Olsen, Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr. If we had those three guys, then... Then we, we could, could get the support of the fans, and, yeah. then, and then we could get the buy-in from the rest of the team, and et cetera. And it worked. Absolutely. At a certain point, we were just relentless about getting the interviews that we needed. You know, we made a master list, and we just went after uh, everybody on the list. And Brad and I did a road trip because most of the people we interviewed for the film lived in the West Coast of the United States. But the folks who didn't, who lived on the East Coast, Brad and I actually flew out to the East Coast and we drove over 4,000 miles up and down the East Coast of the United States, interviewing people all the way from Vermont to Sarasota, Florida. So, Oh, wow. That's dedication. Yeah. So, and that was like a two week trip where we, we literally just drove all over the East Coast and, and the American South. One interview on that trip was Roy Williams. And I just kind of want to mention that because Coach Williams, we reached out to North Carolina to their sports information director and said, we want to interview Coach Williams. He was an assistant coach on the 1988 uh, North Carolina Tar Heels team under Dean Smith, legendary coach. And we wanted to interview Coach Williams about the game that they lost to Arizona. That's a key part of the story of our film. We heard back almost immediately from them. And Coach Williams said, if it's about Lute Olson, then I'm in because I have a great deal of respect for him. Oh, wow. That was another theme that emerged from getting interviews like Roy Williams or Dick Vitale or Billy Packer, some people who weren't necessarily connected to the Arizona program directly. Many of them said because of how much they respected Lute Olson, they wanted to support what we were doing, which was really cool. And I think also... Loot might have helped us a little bit with Roy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We floated to Loot. Just ask him about Roy. and We think that Loot Olson may have texted Roy Williams and said, hey, <laughs> can you do this? Uh, when we're not sure, but if he did, thanks, Coach Olson. Yeah, thank you, Coach. <laughs> That's great. After that road trip on the East Coast, were you sick of the sight of each other? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Silence is golden, hey? <laughs> Those are the trenches. The wartime experiences. No, were. we had so much fun yeah. on that trip. I mean, me and my, my brother, we have a great relationship and we, I mean, we just had fun. We love going on trips together and it was work, but it was also fun. To this day, I think, I don't know how we did it because it was just me and him and we drove and drove and drove and drove <laughs> and stopped and then drove more and then stopped. We shouldn't have been driving because we, we were so tired. Yeah, it was like <laughs> we did two interviews in Atlanta. Uh, the next day, we had an interview in Sarasota. We drove to do that. Then the next day, we had an interview in North Carolina, and we drove up to North Carolina. And that was eight hours that. away. Wow. Yeah, I mean, just Google map it. We most, got to see a lot of America we'd never seen. It was yeah. pretty cool. It's probably not the most sane thing to do, but we got the interviews in the can, which is what mattered. You must have been just running on fumes by the end of it. Um, so as far as your film background then i guess sean and then also brad i believe you both have journalism or communication backgrounds as well with the university of arizona who was actually doing the recording and setting up of the cameras and what equipment were you relying on to get these done sure so the way i explain brad and i's roles in this project to folks is that brad is the arizona basketball wonk he knows <laughs> so much about Arizona basketball. He is an expert in Arizona basketball history, in my humble opinion. And he has done so much research, just hundreds of hours of research, just breaking the story of this movie and looking into the details, you know, to prepare for interviews and things like that. And then what I feel like I've brought to the table is my filmmaking skills. I'm a cinematographer by trade and, you know, I have more experience behind the camera. You know, at the time, I, I owned a couple of Canon DSLRs, and we shot most of the interviews on those. As filmmakers, you got to use what you have on hand. And um, we shot some very beautiful interviews using, you know, the cameras that we had available, which were the Canon DSLRs. But as a cinematographer, I can tell you it's not so much the camera you use, it's how you use it. 
I'm proud of the work that we did on those on those interviews. Oh, me too. Sean made it look spectacular. The trailer is fantastic. I absolutely love it. Um, I think it's just shy of two minutes. It just whets the appetite so much for the documentary. The sound is crystal clear, and it's just weaved together beautifully. So the, the people that are shown on that clip just all contribute to the overall arc of the story. So yeah, really exciting stuff, and uh, I'll definitely be sharing that for what it's worth across social media and whatnot. So yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. Well, thank you. Thank you, Adam. When we would go and do interviews, especially like on that trip we mentioned, it was just me and Brad, you know, so I would set up camera and sound and lights and, you know, we got very efficient at it. And Brad would, you know, spend the previous night preparing and preparing and preparing for the interview. So it was really a team effort. And, you know, Brad on the research side and me on the more of the filmmaking side. Go ahead. Brad. I wanted to mention one thing, too, is, you know, we've had other help, too. Um yeah. One of our good friends, Mustan. Uh, a guy named Mustan Dawood. He's uh, my good friend from University of Miami Film School, and he's a producer on the film. He helped us with many interviews out in California, especially. And then we've had um, help from friends here and there. Mustan, I think, besides Brad and I, has definitely been our, our biggest collaborator on the project. Because I couldn't always be out in California because of work. So Sean and Mustan, they both live in yeah. Southern California. So they would, you know, travel to the Bay Area and I would Skype in the questions. Okay, right. Actually, and it's funny because when we interviewed Tom Tolbert, he gave me a hard time <laughs> because when we interviewed Tom Tolbert, we did it in the Bay Area. Brad couldn't come on the trip. It was me and Mustan and then Brad asked the questions over Skype, essentially. So go ahead, Brad. So then Tom Tolbert says... So, Brad, I got a bone to pick with you. You know, I've never met Tom Tolbert. I've just been a fan of his. <laughs> yeah. And I go, what? What did I do? And he goes, Steve's good enough. You can go interview him at his house, but you can't come interview <laughs> me in the Bay Area. <laughs> and we had interviewed Steve like two years before, three years before him. You know, Tom, he was hilarious. That guy, it was a joke a minute. Oh, yeah. Have you ever had him on your show, Adam? I have not. I'd love to. Oh, man. He seems like such a great personality, and I think uh, to this day he's involved in the the Golden State area in terms of media as well. If you want some comedy on your podcast, like <laughs> like straight up comedy, get Tom Tolbert on your podcast. I'll definitely be looking into that for sure. He was famous uh, in Tucson for that game against North Carolina where Arizona beat them to go to the Final Four. He had this second half that was unbelievable. Everything he threw up was going in. When we interviewed him about it, it was amazing, like his recall. Like he spent five minutes telling us about one shot that he <laughs> maybe it wasn't five minutes, but it was like, and it was every single detail. It was amazing. Yeah. He remembered every beat of that game, and he probably spent 20 or 25 minutes on camera recounting every single detail, which, of course, as filmmakers was fantastic for us. He's got personality for days. Yeah, that's great. He sounds like a great character, and uh, I'd love to have a chat to him at some stage in the future for sure. You mentioned uh, a bit earlier about how Steve Kerr was the team captain in 1988. Uh, he was a senior, but there were some circumstances behind him still being on the roster. Do either one of you mind elaborating on how Steve was still on the team come 1988? You know, Steve Kerr, when he came to Arizona, he was a nobody, and he would say that himself. Mm -hmm. When Lute Olson went to see uh, Steve Kerr play in high school, it was kind of by accident. He was recruiting somebody else. He happened to see Steve. And then as they were walking away from the arena at a different time, his wife, Bobby Olson, he, he asked her, what do you think of this kid? And she basically said, you got to be kidding me. Like thinking this kid's no good. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. But they, they got some chuckles of that later, you know, uh, when they were retiring Steve Kerr's jersey at McHale Center. <laughs> I can imagine. Yep. Yeah, and, and, you know, it was all good. Bobby Olson, she was the team mom, and she loved Steve, and Steve loved her. But you're asking about what made him be able to be on the 88 team. There was the uh, World Championships in 1986. The 88 team was still college for the Olympics, but, you know, the dream team was 92. So Lute Olson was put as the head coach of the USA team at the World Championships in 1986. And there was, like, David Robinson... Muggsy Bogues, Ronnie Cycli, Sean Elliott, Steve Kerr, all these players were on this team. And at the time, you know, that sounds like an all-star team, but it was an amateur team. And they were in the world championships. They actually beat the Russians. You know, Arvidas Sabonis, who a lot of people say is one of the greatest players of all time, maybe the greatest before he went to the NBA. And he was on that team. 
the USA beat the Russians. But before that game against Brazil, Steve Kerr was in the game and he blew out his knee. And he was told that uh, he may never play again. But once he got back to Tucson and they did an evaluation on him, they said, yeah, I think you're going to be okay. Because, you know, back then the injuries, the technology, it was not like today. You know, if you rip up your knee, it's bad, but they can get you back. But 30 years ago, it was a little more daunting task. But they thought, hey, I think we can, you know, come back from this. So he sat out the 1986-87 season and the Cats missed him a lot. They won like 18 games. I think they squeaked into the tournament, lost first round. But you could tell that they were, you know, missing their floor general. So when he came back to play uh, in the 87-88 season, it was his fifth year. And it was basically like six starters were returning because the five starters from the year before and Steve Kerr. So that's why they had such a phenomenal team. Isn't it incredible that he was told his career was effectively over by one medical person and then he gets a second opinion, comes back and ends up playing on five championship teams? (laughs) Remarkable in itself. It is remarkable. It's like a storybook career. Lute Olsen, I don't think the first time he saw him playing, but thinking that this was all going to happen to Steve Kerr. And I mean, he continues to impress with what he does with the Warriors today. It's it's great. Just briefly, Brad, uh, Sean was talking about your research and the depths of research ahead of chatting to these people that you had interviewed for the documentary. What did your research involve? It interests me, and I'm sure it will interest listeners as well. How did that work out for you? That's one reason I really like your podcast. I know all the research that you do. <laughs> For, for your shows. Yeah, I mean, you could tell but just because I've done the same thing with this film. I mean, there were weeks and months where I would just go to the library. I mean, this was years ago. Like now you have newspapers.com, which is a really good reference you can use. But this was before that was all on the internet. So I would just go to the, to the library and, you know, spend hours researching, looking up old newspapers. On microfilm? Yeah, on microfilm. Because at the time, it was really cool. Tucson had two newspapers. They had the Arizona Daily Star and the Tucson Citizen. They both had beat writers for the team. They both covered the Wildcats. So you got so much information because 50 to 75 percent of the stuff was the same, like the quotes and everything. But every once in a while, you'd get a little piece in the Citizen that you didn't get in the Star or the Star and the Citizen. So it was cool to have those two big references. Mm. And then I would also, if they played other games in other cities, like in Tempe or Seattle, I would sometimes look at those, especially for the big games, like in the NCAA tournament and stuff. I would try to find more of a national viewpoint of the game. That's how I I did most of my research. Yeah, I love it. And this is Sean. If, if you could see um, the reams of folders and and papers and binders that Brad has <laughs> collected and put together for this um uh, You'd be pretty impressed, I think. Sounds like no stone has been left unturned, as I say, I guess. Just one thing I did read while I was researching for this chat as well. Uh, When you were chatting with Steve Kerr at his home, I think it was in San Diego, something about some chairs and him getting access to a few chairs to assist with uh, the recording process. Oh, yeah. You being a Bulls fan, I'm sure you're very interested in this. Yeah, my curiosity peaked quite high when I read this little story, an amazing little tidbit. So Steve Kerr allowed us to come to his home. And when we asked him, you know, where, where do you want to do the interview? He, he brought us into a guest house that was adjacent to his home. We're setting up. Steve Kerr comes in. He's chatting with Brad, you know, being very friendly. And he says, um, do you guys need anything? And I go, yeah, you know what, Steve? We could use some chairs, <laughs> maybe like some folding chairs. And he goes, I think I might have some folding chairs. Uh, let me let me check. And of course, it's Steve Kerr. And, you know, I'm like, well, Steve, I'll go with you because I don't want you lugging chairs for us, you know. So I go with him and we go into his garage and he pulls out these chairs that say 1997 Chicago Bulls World Champions. And they were like the, you know, like the courtside chairs, you know. Yeah, that's unbelievable. You know, they had a little dust on them. He just brushed them off and, you know, just gave them to me. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. This is so funny. (laughs) We're like, Michael Jordan probably sat in this chair. (laughs) Jordan sat here. Pippen sat here. Like, Brad and I are geeking out. I think Steve was pretty amused a few minutes later when Brad and I traded turns sitting in the chairs and taking (laughs) photos of each other. (laughs) That's fantastic. I love it. Um, So, on that, how do you guys... Like, how do you stop the inner fandom of knowing so much about these particular guys? 
come to the fore and try and remain as professional as possible doing this documentary. I know it's probably almost impossible to hide it altogether, but it must be difficult to sort of keep some of those feelings uh, down deep without actually uh, coming out just too far over the top. It is very nerve wracking. Uh, like people know who Steve Kerr is. People know who Lou Olson is, but you know, some of these other guys, people wouldn't know, you know, who they were. Um, like Craig McMillan, for instance, who was a McDonald's all American. He's a coach now, uh, at a junior college in California, but he was a great player. Even talking to guys like that, I'd still get nervous. To me, these guys are, you know, my heroes from my youth. One thing they always say is, you don't want to meet your heroes. <laughs> Luckily, that's not true with, you know, the Wildcats that we dealt with for this film. They were all just great. You have to keep it professional, but I think they understood what the movie was, and it is a fan movie, so it wasn't like we were doing outside the lines like a vice piece or something <laughs> on them and i think they understood where we were coming from and it is pretty nerve-wracking to interview steve kerr <laughs> i can only imagine how about sean elliott one of the best high school players in the country probably had a lot of offers to attend many of the quote unquote best universities around what did sean tell you about the reasoning behind him making that decision to attend Arizona and become a Wildcat. The thing about Sean Elliott that's so cool is he's from Tucson, and Tucson is not known for bringing college basketball talent to the Division One level. I mean, I think all time, besides Sean Elliott, the only other player I can think of is Fat Lever. He was really good, but he went to Arizona State. Yeah. There's a thing called A Mountain in Tucson, and it's there's this big A, kind of represents the city and the university. There's a school right behind that named Choya High School, and that's where Sean Elliott went to play. Wow. So he basically grew up three miles from the university, four miles. It was before, you know, the internet, so you didn't discover people the way you do today. Yeah, and because he was from Tucson, and because it was during that era... You know, if he had been in Phoenix, he would have been seen by probably a lot of recruiters. But being in Tucson, he was kind of off the beaten path of the recruiting trail, so to speak. One person who definitely knew who he was and wanted him <laughs> and recruited him was Lid Olson. And went to every one of his games in high school. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, okay. At least his last couple of years, I think. There's so much to say on this topic. But Sean told us a story about, you know, when he was at Choya. Uh, before Luke came to Arizona, there was a coach there for one year and the team did very, very badly. And Sean Elliott recalled going to those games during that abysmal year and there'd be nobody there. And he said by the second half, he was sitting in the third or fourth row, you know, because he'd start in the rafters and he'd kind of work his way down and he'd be sitting in the third or fourth row. And it was because there was no one at the game. And he said himself, and I think he says it in our trailer, he, he didn't imagine himself going to Arizona. He thought he wanted to play at a school that was on TV every Saturday, like an Indiana or a Michigan or something like that. He himself said that the thing that changed his mind is seeing Lute Olson come in, seeing Lute Olson turn around the program and create a culture of winning and excellence. I think that's what really sold Sean. And then <laughs> Lute Olson is known as a charmer in terms of recruiting. And I think Josh Pastner said, Lute Olson never lost a mom. Like even if the player himself wasn't completely sold, maybe on Arizona after talking to Lute, that player's mom was sold. Oh, I love it. And, and that was instrumental in getting Sean Elliott to Arizona too, is that Lute Olson made it such a good impression on his mother and his mother valued integrity and and thought that Lute would be a good coach for her son to play for. Very important qualities. From what I've actually read, you would have an item that you take with you to your interviews, which you'd ask the interviewee to sign. Um, what is that item and how many signatures did you have at last count? It was kind of a fluke the way it started. When we interviewed Steve Kerr, uh, we were done with the interview and Sean had an NBA basketball in his car, and we thought, why don't we just have him sign it? You know, to Brad and Sean, go Cats, uh, Steve Kerr. So we got this thing signed, and then Steve Kerr went back in his house, and Steve Kerr had a basket out in his front porch, you know. 
<laughs> so we're like, I go, we have to shoot some baskets on Steve Kerr's hoop. You know, they, they just we have to do this. <laughs> you have to, of course. <laughs> yeah. So and the ball was signed already, but we didn't care. We were like, well, it's okay if we just shoot a couple times. We make one basket each. <laughs> and it did survive. The signature survived. But then what we ended up doing is everywhere we'd go that someone was going to be in the movie, they would sign it. So, I mean, this basketball had Lou Olson on it, Dick Vitale. It had Roy Williams, Sean Elliott, Pretty much. Bushler. I'm sorry, Brad. That's right. Mike Bibby. We interviewed Mike Bibby. Like, I mean, it was just so many guys. And that actually was really great because we did a Kickstarter. Yeah, and pretty much everyone we interviewed signed the ball. I think the only person who didn't was Mike Bibby, and it's because we – we didn't have it with us that day, so we had Mike Bibby sign a different ball. But anyway, when we did the Kickstarter, suddenly we had this ball with a bunch of signatures on it, and that's one of the rewards we offered a would-be associate producer. And a very nice guy named Tommy uh, pledged at that level, and he ended up getting the ball. Oh, how cool. Tommy's got a really cool ball. And a Mike Bibby ball. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't actually know that was part of the Kickstarter campaign. That's so cool. Yeah, what a great reward that is. How did you find the process of doing the crowdfunding campaign? I assume you wouldn't have had much background, if any, in actually trying to do something like that previously. So how did that come together for you and what did you make of that uh, fundraising effort? Yeah, so I had a little bit of experience running a Kickstarter campaign because I had made a web series called The Invisible Man. All right. Okay. And we had raised a little bit of money for that, not as much as we were aiming to raise for Wild About 88. But I had learned some valuable lessons from that experience and uh, ended up with Brad's help running the campaign for a while, about 88. A couple of things about that process. One is it's a ton of work. When If you're going to do a Kickstarter, you got to realize it's going to be kind of like your second job for a month or a month and a half, as long as it takes for it to run. Plus, it's going to be kind of your second job fulfilling rewards later on. Especially if you're serious about it and you're serious about connecting with your fans and supporters in a, in a meaningful way, making sure that they get out of the process something great as well. Definitely learned that it was a lot of hard work. What we also drew from it was the support that we felt because Brad and I had this idea and, and the Kickstarter was sort of our um, coming out party where we could say to the fans, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what amount of money we need to get so far in the process. And we were overwhelmed by the wonderful support we received from Wildcat fans, most of whom we didn't know or hadn't met before, but just wanted to see a movie about Lute Olson and his building that program up because it meant so much to them. So um, it was a very special experience in that way. And of course, um, part of what motivates us to uh, finish the film and part of what motivates us to make the absolute best film that we possibly can. Is for those fans. Yeah, we want to do it for them. And I've always thought of the film, I mean, of course, it's a gift to the Kickstarter supporters, and it'll be a gift to anyone else who ends up supporting the film. But I've always thought of the film as a gift to Tucson and a love letter to the city that, that raised us, the entire city something, just like that 88 team did, something that they can enjoy and be proud of that will be very special to them. So that's one of our goals with the movie. Fantastic. The 1988 Wildcats went an amazing 35-3 and three and made it all the way to the final four. Uh, I noticed that during the NCAA tournament, Arizona dispatched of Iowa. Coach Olson had left Iowa after the 83 season, I think it was, to become the head coach at Arizona. So I assume based on your research, Brad, did you have the opportunity to discuss that with Lute in the documentary? And, and what were his thoughts on that time in his life? Yeah, that season, actually, Arizona got to play Iowa twice because they had set up a home and home uh, with Iowa. And they had come to er Tucson the previous season to play. And then that season, they went to Iowa to play like in December. That was one of the teams they beat early on that, that got to be eventually number one. And that was a huge game for Lute. And all the players knew it because they knew they wanted to win this game for coach. The regular season game. Yeah, it was a regular season game. It was a really uh, low-scoring game. It was a defensive battle. Uh, but I think Judd Bushler hit some big free throws late. Sean Elliott fouled out. It was like the only time he fouled out in his college career. And the Cats won. As far as him speaking about you know leaving Tucson, him and his wife wanted to be on the West Coast because – he thought his family was going to be – like his kids and his grandkids are going to be on the West Coast eventually because um, they had grown up out there. He would coached 
you know, high school in Southern California, and then he was at Long Beach City College also. And he was actually kind of a protege to John Wooden. He would go to these clinics John Wooden would have, and John Wooden and him were uh, good friends. But that was one reason that he wanted to leave. And then he, he, one joke he always loves, it's not, I don't think it's that he didn't like Iowa. He liked Iowa and he liked the fans there. And he said, you've never had to spend nine winters in Iowa before, something like that. <laughs> So that was another big reason is I think he liked shoveling sunshine more than he liked shoveling snow. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Brad talked about the regular season game and how it meant so much to Coach Olson and how the players really wanted to win it for him. But most of the guys we interviewed about that tournament game that you asked about, they at that point felt like, okay, we've played them before. We know how to beat them. And then they did beat them soundly. So I think by the time they got to the tournament, it was less about winning one for the Gipper. <laughs> and more about uh, advancing. So many guys, too. You know, we'd ask them about all the tournament games, and we'd get to that Iowa tournament game, and they'd say, I don't remember anything about that game. I just remember we beat North Carolina the next game. Because <laughs> <laughs> that game, I mean, if you look at the program's history, that North Carolina game, top five of all time for, you know, obviously the national championship. But, I mean, that kind of put a stamp on the program that, Arizona was a big boy in college basketball, and it, and it has been since, even though there's been a few roadblocks you know, since then. Yeah, I'm just looking at that box score now for that game against North Carolina. It was a 70-52 to 52 win. Sean Allard had 24 points, Tom Talbot 21, Steve Kerr 14, and so on. So uh, good memories for them, no doubt. The Wildcats season came to an end just one game shy of the national championship. The Oklahoma Sooners, which was another team that was loaded with future NBAers, uh, upended Arizona 86-78. to Do either of you remember watching the game at the time, back in 88? Oh, yeah. So how did you react to a season for the ages that ended so close to that title game? It was painful because as a kid, you don't really understand that your team can lose. I was a San Diego Padres fan, which is a baseball team here in America, and they're really bad. So I knew they could lose. But when the Wildcats, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the Wildcats that season, it just thought they're not going to lose. And that's the thing about the NCAA tournament that's so great and so bad at the same time is anybody can win and anybody can lose because it's one game. And I remember watching that game and Steve Kerr missing all those shots. And I was just thinking, how is this happening? I think even Kevin O'Neill, one of the assistants on the team, he even said that to us. It's like, how is this happening? This isn't how it's supposed to be how this goes. And you look back at it now and it's okay. You know, as a kid, it's hard to take. It was okay. You know, who's going to get mad at Steve Kerr? Because he had a horrible game. And I remember someone we interviewed, he had mentioned that. Like, who in their right mind could get mad at Steve Kerr? He gave everything he could to this university. And that's what he did. And I mean, that team even though they didn't win the whole thing. To us, it feels like a national championship team. Yeah. And in fact, there's a scene in our film called From Failures to Champions. One theme of our film and one thing we focus on is how they lost that game, but the town still treated them like royalty, like they had won the whole thing. We'll save the best drama for the movie. <laughs> yeah, as you should. The town treated them and treats them to this day like they're champions. This season right now, Arizona is not having a very good season. This is the 35th straight year that Arizona has led the conference in attendance. And it's not even close. Like they average, you know, nearly 14,000 fans a game. I think the next team in the Pac-12 is maybe at 10 or 11,000. So mm. that team, it was a culture changing team for the city. And I mean, that was a generation ago. The parents have taught their kids. And I mean, it's kind of like Star Wars and how <laughs> there's like, you know, all these different generations who love Star Wars. And that's how it is with Arizona basketball in Tucson. Has there been anybody that you haven't yet had a chance to interview that you would like to speak to prior to getting the documentary finalized? Yeah, we'd still love to talk to Anthony Cook, who is a great player from that team, who uh, unfortunately we haven't had a chance to talk to yet, but we'd still like to talk to him. He had a, a short career in the NBA with the Denver Nuggets, I think. He was a, a great player and a player that doesn't get enough credit for that team. He could jump out of the gym. He led the league in blocks. Um, it was just dunk fest all year with him. And he's one guy that a lot of fans, we forget about him because, you know, we had Steve Kerr, we had Sean Elliott, Tom Tolbert. Another guy we'd love to talk to, and he's not a Wildcat, is Coach K because – 
Arizona played Duke that season. And we all know now Coach K is a legend. A lot of Arizona fans don't really like Coach K, but <laughs> he's a legend. You know, he's the modern day John Wooden. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'd love to talk to him too. Duke played Arizona and Mikhail that year in, in one of the classic games, probably a top 10 game in Mikhail history. I'm just looking at the box scores now for that season. So it looks like it was December 30, 1987, a 91-85 to 85 victory at Mikhail Center. Yep. We know Coach K is an avid listener of this podcast. Uh, so if you're listening, <laughs> Coach K, uh, give us a call. I'm just sending Mike a text as we speak. So oh, thank you, Adam. <laughs> ensure that he uh, gets back to you in a timely fashion. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully you can get in touch with Anthony Cook and, and Coach K comes to the party as well and uh, you have a chance to include his comments in the documentary as well. As we record this in February of 2019, um, how are things progressing with the project? It's going well. We've pretty much shot all the interviews we need to shoot. And although we did intend to originally release the movie earlier than now, as often happens with large creative projects or even just large projects, you know, we... We hit some obstacles, some unforeseen speed bumps. Brad and I have been working on a a new fundraising plan so that we can get the money we need to get through post-production and do everything right. Make it the movie that we want it to be and that the fans deserve it to be. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have made some significant progress on that. We want it to be great. That's why it's taking as long as it has, in my opinion. Sure, you can slap something together. You know, when you've worked years and years on a project and you're passionate about it, and you're a perfectionist. <laughs> like, which we are. Which we are. We want it to be absolutely the very best it can be, and that's what we're going to do. We want it something that Lou Olson will be proud of, and the rest of Tucson. Really well said. Further to that, how can people who are listening to the show that want to put their support behind the project uh, help you in any way? If you go to our website, www.wildabout88.com, There's a way to easily contact us there. And if anyone's interested in supporting the film, either financially or through connections to maybe someone else that may want to help financially, they can feel free to reach out to us and Brad and I will respond personally to them. Or even, you know, somebody that is working at at Netflix or Hulu or ESPN, whatever, you know, anything that, that could be a positive force to getting the movie done. So, yeah, thank you for asking us about that. No worries at all. Just moving on to one last question, I do like to ask my guests about a regular feature that appeared in Basketball Digest. It was called The Game, I'll Never Forget. Is there a game from your basketball fandom that stands out the most to you? Well, I got two, if that's okay. Multiple's fine. I want to give Arizona its respect, but I have an NBA one that Sean and I share. But the first game, the game I'll never forget, is when Arizona won the national title in 1997. I couldn't believe that the team from my hometown won the national title. I still can't believe it to this day. I mean, that's been 22 years. I still think about that every day. My commemorative clock that I look at, I, you know, it's hard not to, but <laughs> it was really cool. And that's another reason that we're doing the film is just how much Arizona basketball has meant to Tucson and to me personally and to Sean. Um, but that game, I'll never forget. My NBA game, I'll never forget. Adam, you'll probably be very interested in. <laughs> I think it was 2002, if I remember correctly. My dad, you know, in the early 2000s, he was able to get his tickets to Suns games. We got to see like Kobe and Shaq and uh, Kevin Garnett. Everything got topped when Michael Jordan, it wasn't the Michael Jordan of the Bulls, but Michael Jordan came back with the Wizards. And we said, Dad, can we get tickets to the Wizards? Can you find a way? So my dad, he took myself, my brother, my sister, all of us to go see Michael Jordan and the Wizards. We had great seats. It was like the 19th row up in Phoenix against the Suns. You know, MJ, he's not what he used to be at this game, but it's still MJ. And he'd come in for a couple minutes and he'd go sit back down. Well, the game's really close. And then it gets down to, you know, like 10 seconds left. The Suns are up by one. Everyone in the building knows who the ball is going to. (laughs) Everybody's on their feet. Everybody's cheering. Every Suns fan has become a Wizards fan. <laughs> Everybody wants to see Michael Jordan hit a last second shot, right? Of course. He dribbles down the court and he pulls up. He was on our side of the court too, where you hit the shot. It was awesome. <laughs> Michael Jordan with four seconds. Fakes, shoots. Oh, oh, I love it. He did it again. Oh. He did it again. He did it again. Jordan, the greatest player of all time. The Wizards. 
Wizards have not beaten the Suns in Phoenix since February of 1988. So he had a shot. I think it was point two seconds left on the clock. And the Wizards were up by one. And everyone in the arena was happy. I have a picture. I'll send it to you, Adam, where I'm just taking pictures of the crowd and everyone's smiling. Everyone's just <laughs> in a good mood. We're all rooting for the Suns. We live in Arizona, but... We wanted MJ to hit that shot, and he hit it, and another game I'll never forget. I was there, too, and I just remember how the entire place just erupted with joy. So much volume. I mean, that place was so loud when he hit that shot. And and like Brad said, every Suns fan became a Wizards fan. Everyone knew that we were about to see something special, and then we did. I've been to, like, tons of sporting events in my life. I've been very blessed to be able to go. In Major League Baseball games, tons and tons of college basketball games, seeing great players play, Hall of Fame players. But that moment, all the things I've ever seen in person, that was physically the greatest sports moment I'd ever physically seen. Wow. That says a lot, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So this is February 15th, 2002. I've since looked it up on basketballreference.com. The Wizards had a 97 to 96 win. And Jordan had 22 points. Uh, He didn't shoot terribly well, except for the one that mattered, 7 of 19 from the field. But just a fantastic game when he shot. I remember this game because our internet speeds weren't great back in Australia in the early 2000s. And I recall we were renting a place at the time and we had pretty ordinary dial-up internet. They had the ESPN Gamecast. You could watch the stats sort of as they happened. It would gradually update itself every 30 seconds, whatever it was. And we had to head out. I'm sure it was an afternoon here in Australia, so it would have been a night game, I guess, over there. The scores were showing that Washington were down less than half a minute left, and I was freaking out because I was following Jordan like you wouldn't believe. Back at that stage, I loved his comeback with the Wizards, contrary to what most people say. (laughs) I had to leave knowing that there was less than 30 seconds left, and I didn't know what the result was going to be of the game. So anyhow, I went out and did whatever we had to do, came back, ran back to where the computer was, clicked refresh, on the Gamecast, it took forever, it seemed, to update, and then it showed 97, 96 Wizards. I swear, I almost cried, I reckon, when I saw that <laughs> they had that win, because that's how much it meant to me back at the time. A sad indictment on my life, really, as a basketball fan and Michael Jordan, tragic, but <laughs> 15,000 kilometers away and still loved it. Uh, just hearing you talk about it now makes me smile from ear to ear. I think it's great, Adam. <laughs> I took a photo right when he was releasing the ball. Oh, nice. It's kind of blurry. You still can see what's happening. Well, to have the presence of mind to do that, that's a pretty fair effort. (laughs) (laughs) The game that I'll never forget, well, it's technically a game (laughs) because I am a huge Dominique Wilkins fan. When I was a kid, Dominique Wilkins was like my favorite player. And I think it's probably indicative of my later tendency to kind of be a contrarian. Oh, everyone loves Jordan. He's the greatest player in the world. Who's your favorite player, Sean? Dominique Wilkins, right? (laughs) The game I'll never forget, if you can call it a game, is the 1988 Slam Dunk Contest. (laughs) I knew you were going there. Yeah. I love it. Go ahead. I don't have much to say about it other than Dominique was robbed. He was. I agree. And I'm the biggest Jordan homer in the world. (laughs) And he was absolutely robbed. I guarantee you he will not get 50 on this dunk. Guaranteed. A two-handed windmill, and the judges, their entire lives are flashing in front of their eyes. We watched Dominique Wilkins come in and again with a power and authority low with two hands. And the judges have awarded Dominique Wilkins a 45. That's incredible. (laughs) Could we call it a make good? It was at Chicago Stadium. The judges wouldn't have got out of there alive (laughs) had Nick won it. But yeah, one of my best friends, Aaron, hello to Aaron if you're listening, Uh, he is a massive Dominique fan, and uh, I'm sure he'll empathize greatly with that as well, as will Dominique. Not that he'll ever listen to the show, but uh, what a memory that was for for Bulls fans and Jordan fans, but not so much for Nick fans, because he was absolutely ripped. (laughs) (laughs) I would like to give a solemn shout-out of solidarity to my brother Aaron, (laughs) fellow Dominique fan, (laughs) who saw things as they were, you know? I'm sure he'll love that. Whenever Sean was a kid in his room... His room was painted yellow, but he actually drew on the wall, wasn't it marker? In red marker. Red marker, number 21, (laughs) Wilkins. It was up there for years, and my dad, Sean moved out, and he was repainting the room, 
my dad says he hesitated for you know a few seconds before he painted <laughs> over it because it was such a staple in Sean's life and his. Oh room. yeah, I have Dominique posters, and I will be first to say Brad. You know, he takes the crown in our family for being the biggest sports fan. But as a kid, man, I I just I idolized Dominique because he was a force of nature. He was so athletic. He was so much fun to watch play. He was incredible, and. The Hawks had awesome uniforms. I just want to say that. Those Hawks yeah. uniforms, man, you cannot beat those Hawks uniforms. No, they were classic, weren't they? Guys, it's been fantastic to have a chance to chat with you. Thank you, Brad and Sean, uh, for making time to speak with me today. And I really do wish you every success with the documentary. Uh, I hope it comes together exactly as you plan. You've put in so much work, uh, dedication and passion to the project that it deserves to have a wide release and uh, enjoy the success that should come its way. Thank you, Adam. And thank you so much for helping us spread the word a little more on your podcast. Yeah. Thanks for your interest. We really appreciate it. I love your podcast. It's great. I also do a podcast called uh, Bear Down Bias. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. It's just an Arizona Wildcats basketball podcast. It's about everything from the past to the present to the future. There's one on there about Shaq I did. Um, There's one with Steve Kerr interview clips. Uh, so even if you're not a Wildcats fan, there's some NBA stuff on there that you might find interesting. You sent me some links very kindly uh, a few weeks back, and I listened to some of those clips with the ones that were pertaining to the documentary project, and they're, they're a great listen, so I heartily recommend those as well. I'll include links to this and more in the show notes wherever people are listening to this on whatever app it might be. Otherwise, on my website, no worries at all, guys. Thanks, buddy. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. You can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. You really can leave a voicemail. Simply visit inallairness.com slash voice. Click start recording, leave your message and press stop. You can even listen back before submitting, press send and you're done. Worldwide, the show is nearing 80 reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for your continued support and if you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Your word-of-mouth recommendations are truly worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and much more. Simply visit inallairness.com slash news. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Search for In All Airness, three words, on your podcast app of choice. The show is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Android, Pocket Casts, and more. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues, inallairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at InAllAnnis. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash InAllAnnis. Join me next time for another edition of the show.